Professor Bande for this invitation to this uh, extraordinary gathering and conference. I feel not at all competent actually to be present here, but uh, I have humbly accepted this invitation and I hope that I can give some input or contribution to this uh, conference from my own experience, which is absolute lacking expertise which you are holding in commerce and economies. I'm not an economist. As you have heard in the introduction, I have devoted all my life to study the ancient scriptures of Sanskrit and their translation in Tibetan. That means I was always on the search of the ancient wisdom, particularly of this sacred country and the home of uh, Lord Buddha, where he spread first his message, which is actually the focus of all my research. Now, what this has to do with trade uh, remains to be seen, but in the larger uh, spectrum, of my uh, studies, I understand myself as a cultural historian. And uh, that means one, uh, or one is able after some time to see the interconnectedness of uh, all these historical events with other aspects of uh, life, such as the the geography, the environment, the climate, and certainly also the politics, and, uh, and trade and commerce, and how powers, invested powers, change in the course of time. And to draw up this chronology on an interdisciplinary level is actually the work of a cultural historian. So in my lecture, my short presentation, which I will give you tomorrow. I will just give you a glimpse of it from the perspective of uh, history. I go back into the ancient history of India in, and their relationship with Tibet. And uh, if there are any other questions open from the audience, regarding the Indo-Tibetan relationship or China relationship from my personal experience uh, drawn from my travels to Tibet and Mongolia, I'm happy to answer that. I can, will just observe that uh, what I found is uh, vital and generally resented speaking in field studies to the villagers to the nomads, to the herdsmen, to the peasants, is first of all that centralization is most of the time resented. Because uh, centralization uh, leaves the ordinary peasant, a small person, actually uh, powerless, hopeless. I give you one example from a study which I did in the Austrian Alps, a small village of hardly 400 inhabitants because of the European Union, you know, orders of trade, uh, they were requested to destroy their wool, which they have harvested from their sheep flocks. And they would be paid a certain amount of money for each kilo of wool they have destroyed. Now, the brave mayor of this small village used a bit of a rude language to refuse this order, saying, we will not do that at all because we consider that to be a sin. And so they organized themselves in the village, bought, collected money, bought machines to wash and treat the wool 
uh, themselves and sell their product themselves, which was very successful. You see, in a small, small unit with confidence and also a certain pride, one can even confront on such a small level a central power like the uh, European Union. This is just an example that individualism and a strong community is the strength of a state and also of a successful and sustainable trade of which all may benefit. So this is my short contribution, although, excuse me, I am not an expert and I have not studied this subject properly. Thank you.